understand. This is why we gather the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this glorious day and this body of believers for uh, drawing us together. We come for one reason, and that is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pay homage, honor to you uh, by singing praises and to gathering together, for loving each other, Lord Jesus. So we bless you, Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit of God, move among us this morning. Take us from where we are to where you want us to be. Lead us, Holy Spirit of God. Show us how to praise, pray, and worship this morning, and even how to fellowship. We look to you, Lord. Bless you, Lord Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Yes, and hallelujah, Lord. We come here to hear from you, Lord. Lord, we storm the gates of heaven, Lord, for a greater faith, for a greater understanding of your mighty work for us on the cross, Lord. Let, us, let it affect our soul, Lord, and every bit of who we are to appreciate the one who's redeemed us, the one that has changed us. And Lord, this chorus is today so centered, so right, Lord, to understand your will, Lord, to understand your goodness toward us, Lord. We stand in your power. We stand because you stand alone, Lord. Otherwise, we would be cast and driven, lost sinners in a lost world, Lord, but by your mercy. Lord, you've, you've spoken light into our lives. Lord, you've opened our hearts to the radical truth of who you are and what you've done. Lord, you've given us purpose and meaning to our life because of the great and glorious gospel. Lord, we give our lives to you, Lord. We're here to hear from you. Lord Jesus, speak to our souls, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for uh, the greatness of our Savior. We thank you, Lord, uh, yes. for the greatness that you have... Uh, brought in our lives and saving us and causing us to be born again to a living hope for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And Lord, we pray that uh, as your people and as your inheritance, Lord, that we would um, bring glory and honor to your name in greater way and greater measure. Help us to have a better understanding, Lord, of who you are, what you've done for us, what you call us to do, how we ought to live uh, because of who you are, Lord. Thank you for that assurance that we have in knowing you. Lord, may that um, affect the way we live, move, and have our being, our witness for you as well. So move in our midst, Holy Spirit. You are welcome here. Speak to our hearts. Continue to speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters and friends. This morning I'm going to share a little something before I get to the verses. Um, this afternoon, my family and I had the privilege of uh, going to a, an infant baptism in our family. And um, when you go to these things, you're never quite sure. But we wanted to bring a gift that would glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ended up finding a, a book, a Jesus story book. And I, I'm not... And this is an infomercial, I'm trying to give anyone a recommendation, but we had gotten this book and my wife and I were reading it the other night. We're both in tears. It is just a childlike faith in, that we need. And this book brings that to us. I just wanted to read it, just a few pages, um, and maybe it'll move on your heart for the glory of God, and uh, perhaps as a gift of for a little one to buy me it. So just enjoy this for a moment, if you will. This is from Genesis 3. Adam and Eve lived happily together in their beautiful new home, and everything was perfect for a while, until the day when everything went wrong. God had a horrible enemy, and his name was Satan. Satan had once been the most beautiful angel, but he didn't want to be just an angel. He wanted to be God. He grew proud and evil and hate-filled. And God had sent him out of heaven. Satan was seething with anger and looking for a way to hurt God. He wanted to stop God's plan, stop this love story right there. So he disguised himself as a snake and waited in the garden. Now God had given Adam and Eve only one rule. Don't eat from the fruit on that tree, God told them. Because if you do, you'll think you know everything. You'll stop trusting me. And then death and sadness and tears will come. You see, God knew if they ate the fruit, they would think they didn't need him. 
and they would try to make themselves happy without him. But God knew there was no such thing as happiness without him, and life without him would not be life at all. As soon as the snake saw his chance, he slithered silently up to Eve. Does God really love you? The serpent whispered. If he does, why won't he let you eat that nice, juicy, delicious fruit? Poor you. Perhaps God doesn't want you to be happy. The snake's words hissed in her ears and sunk down deep into her heart like poison. Does God love me? Eve wondered. Suddenly she didn't know anymore. Just trust me, the serpent whispered. You don't need God. One small taste, that's all, and you'll be happier than you can ever dream. Eve picked the fruit and ate some, and Adam ate some too. And a terrible lie came into the world that would never leave. It would live on in every human heart, whispering to everyone of God's children that God doesn't love me. And it wasn't a dream, it was a nightmare. A dove flew from Adam's hand and a deer darted in a thicket. It was as if they were frightened by something. A chill was in the air. Something strange was happening. They had always been naked, but now they felt naked and wrong, and they didn't want anyone to see them, so they hid. Later that evening, as God was taking his walk, he called to them, Children! Usually Adam and Eve loved to hear God's voice, and they would run to him. But this time they ran away and hid, hid in the shadows. Where are you, God called. Hiding, Adam said, we're afraid of you. Did you eat the fruit I told you not to eat, God asked them. Adam said, Eve made me do it. What have you done, God asked. Eve said, the serpent made me do it. And terrible pain came into God's heart. His children hadn't just broken the one rule, they had broken God's heart. They had broken their wonderful relationship with him. And now he knew everything else would break. God's creation would start to unravel and become undone and go wrong. From now on, everything would die, even though it was supposed to last forever. You see, sin had come into God's perfect world, and it would never leave. God's children would always be running away from him and hiding in the dark. Their hearts would break now and would never properly work again. God couldn't let his children live forever, not in such pain without him. There was only one way to protect them. You will have to leave the garden now, God told his children, his eyes filled with tears. This is no longer your true home. It's not the place for you anymore. But before they left the garden, God made clothes for his children to cover them. He gently clothed them and he sent them away on a long journey out of the garden and out of their home. But that's not the end of the story. God loved his children too much to let the story end there. Even though he knew he would suffer, God had a plan, a magnificent dream. One day he would get his children back. One day he would make the world their perfect home again. And one day he would wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreakable, always and forever love. And though they would forget him and run from him, deep in their hearts, God's children would miss him always and long for him. Lost children yearning for their home. Before they left the garden, God whispered a promise to Adam and Eve. It will not always be so. I will come to rescue you. And when I do, I'm going to do battle against the snake. I'll get rid of the sin and the dark and the sadness you let in here. I'm coming back for you. And he would. One day God himself would come. What a beautiful picture of a childlike faith, rightly centered on the word of God. So, just as an encouragement to hear um, how the stories of the Bible are brought forth, very, very helpful. The entire book is filled with these stories in, in a way that, uh, if, as the title of the book says, every story whispers his name. Amen. Enjoy that. If you're interested, I'll, I'll get you the name and the information on it. This morning I'm going to read you some verses out of um, 
1 John, it's a typo in the bulletin, it's going to be 1 John chapter 3, it will be verses 19 through 24, found on page 1209 in our Pew Bibles, any period, please. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit he's given us. And God bless the reading of his word to your soul. We be seated. Restarting our worship series that we were in back toward the end of last year, uh, growing deeper in our understanding of uh, God uh, through the fundamentals of the faith, through a, um, through a worship series through the book of 1 John. And um, so we're kind of picking that back up again this morning and might finish the book. We're in that verse, 1 John 3 19 to 24. Reminded me, like, I remember reading a story about um, John Calvin. He would do guest preaching in different places or conferences or whatnot. And um, if he went to a place, let's say on July or say June 24, 2018, for instance, and he preached a message there on 1 John 3, 19 through 24, if he was invited back or went back to that place, then the next time he preached, he preached on 1 John 4. He just continued. Um, uh, the message. Um, so we're kind of continuing for a real quick reminder as we were going through 1 John back toward the end of last year we saw that in the first chapter there Jesus is the word of life and the whole book of 1 John is uh, written by the Apostle John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the whole purpose of it was to help the believers to grow in their faith, to be established in their faith especially in the light of false teaching that was um, pervading the church. We saw that in 1 John 1, that God is light and there is no darkness at all. We saw that Jesus is our advocate who provides victory over sin. And then we asked this question, does my life demonstrate that I know God? Then we looked at how Jesus affirms the blessing and the hope that there is in knowing God. Knowing God is a major theme in uh, 1 John in fact, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 10 through 13, which I'll probably quote at the end here this morning, but the verse says, The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself, and the one who does not believe in God has made him a liar, because he's not believed the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. That God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. And just how critical and how important that message is. It's the same thing as what Jesus, or what John said in John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, to know Thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. 
He says that this is a testimony that God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. So the whole book is all about that. Verse 12 says, this is so good for us as believers. It's good for new believers. I remember a new believer, not even a new believer, when I was at um, a, a different church, Mugatek Valley Community Church years ago, there was a lady there who did not have the assurance of her salvation. No matter I talked to her, Pastor Tim talked to her, no matter who talked to her, some of us in this room probably talked to her, tried to help her um, to have the assurance of her salvation, and she just never did. She always had a doubt. She always had, well, what if? Maybe I'm not saved. And it was a real struggle for her. First John 5, 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe, and that word believe is so critical in John's gospel, it's so critical in John's epistles, that you believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know Amen. you have eternal life. So it's a good message here this morning. The book is a good book for new believers. It's a good book for established believers just reaffirming who we are in Christ. We saw in this series, love for the world is incompatible with love for God. We saw that we're living in the last hour. We saw that we are children of God. And on November 18th, 2017, which is where we stopped the going through 1 John, we celebrated that Jesus came to take away our sin. So the title here this morning is Celebrating Our Blessed Assurance. And um, the assurance that we sang about, Jesus is mine, and the assurance that we have in knowing him, celebrating that here this morning. The central idea is that true believers can have the assurance that they're saved from their sins. True believers can know that they have eternal life. True believers can know that they have salvation and forgiveness of sin. However you want to word it, it's a great, blessed assurance and thought to have a great effect on how we live today. It would have a great effect on how we view life and situations and circumstances and how we view our life and our ministry and the lostness around us of people who need to know Jesus. So you have your bullet points there in the bulletin. True believers can have the assurance that they're saved from their sins because we belong to God. Hallelujah, we celebrate that. And because we believe in God's Son, Hallelujah, we celebrate that. And now this is all about God. This is all about what God has done, right? In enabling us to belong to Him and enabling us to believe in His Son. And so you have here the doctrine of um, election, right? That He saved us, that He called us. So because um, we can have the assurance that we're saved from our sins because of those two points, first fill in the blank is the confidence. True believers have confidence before God. Okay? Just as I read that, I think to myself, yes, confidence in being saved, confidence before God in life, what we're facing now, what the situation is, what the circumstances are, whatever it is that's going around us, it's happening to us. We can have confidence before God. The verse is verse 21 and We'll read that now and we'll come back to it in a minute. We'll start with verse 19, but just to hear that verse, beloved. Don't you love that? I love when, when the Bible says beloved. It calls us beloved, his children. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Jesus, help us. Help us to see the confidence that we have before you. Help us to see anew, afresh, the assurance and the blessing of the assurance that we have in knowing that Jesus is ours. Help us to see the blessing anew and afresh that, that uh, you've enabled us, that we belong to you, and that we believe in your Son. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 19 says, We know by this that we are of the truth, and he will assure our heart before him. We know by this that we are of the truth. By what truth? How do we know? Well, it harkens back to what we did on November 18th when we were talking about love and how he laid down his life for us, like verse 16. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for each other, for the brethren. 
But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? That's a big, huge word in the Gospel of John and in this, this letter that's coming up. Abide in him. Remain in him. Verse 19 says, Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. So we know by this, by our love for one another, by our love for the brethren, that we belong to the truth, that we are of the truth. Remember when Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? He questioned Jesus. He told Jesus, Jesus told him, you, I have, he would tell Jesus, I have the power of authority to release you or the power to crucify you. And Jesus said, you would have no power given over, over me were not given to you from above. And that whole exchange about the truth. So we could know that we are of the truth. Praise God for that, right? One of my other favorite verses is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And when I heard the message last week in the church that we were at, the gospel was not there at all. And the truth of who Jesus Christ was not there at all. We know the truth. The most important thing for us to know is the truth, is to know the truth of who Jesus is and who we are in light of his glorious presence. So verse 19 says, We know this, but we are of the truth, and he will assure our hearts before him. There's that um, assurance. Right? Do you hear that, beloved? That assurance, the, the confidence that we have as believers before God. The confidence that we have, not because of who we are, but because of who he is and who we are in light of his glorious presence. That word assure means to convince, to persuade, and the whole epistle is written uh, toward that end, um, giving um, the newer believers uh, the assurance and the confidence that they have, that they do God, that they belong to him. So we got this great expression of confidence before God. And John speaks of our relationship to God, and he offers of this very sweet promise here to those who belong to him, right? True believers belong to God. True believers believe in God's Son. Our hearts, through the power of the Holy Spirit, assure us, because of and the Holy Spirit in us is our hope of glory. Our Holy, the Holy Spirit in it is our deposit, is our down payment, a more of the life of Jesus to come. Verses 20 and 21 says, And whenever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart, thank God for that. Amen. Thank God that he's greater than our heart. You know what Jeremiah says about the heart, right? Wicked, deceitful. I've used this illustration so many times. When a professing believer in Christ said to me, I'm just following my heart. And I use the word professing in quotations. I don't know, don't do that. That's the worst thing that you could do, is follow your heart. As he was condoning his sin. It's the worst thing you can do is follow your heart. It's wicked, deceitful, beyond anything anyone could imagine. So John gives the assurance here, beloved, there's beloved again, verse 21, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If our heart does not condemn us. Even as believers in Christ, sometimes there's a contradiction or there's an uneasiness, I experienced it this past week, a uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I was dealing with something, I think, I asked Cheryl a couple times, is it really sin? She says, duh, you have to ask me that? And it's like, my heart was being convicted over a particular thing and I didn't want to admit it, I didn't want to see it, I didn't want to deal with it. That's because our heart is like you could justify a lot of different things <clears throat> in your heart. But the Holy Spirit is there to convict our heart. So an awareness of this conviction, or sometimes there's this contradiction <clears throat> in our life. Maybe you're dealing with something like that right now where there's a, a, a gnawing within your soul that something's not right between you and God, or there's some particular event or thing happening in 
going on or action or behavior that um, is displeasing to God. And that's the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, even as a believer in Christ. Thank God he does that, condemning you, in a sense, to draw you in me to confession and repentance. See, on the one hand, we got Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God and thank him for that, that we are saved, we're secure in him. But then there's the times where we're convicted um, by the Holy Spirit. The word there, condemn, sort of isn't like what we think of condemn, like condemn to die or condemn criminal. It really means to, 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 to know and to go against. Okay? So there's where we could be guilty of that, going against right, what God wants for us. So true believers are becoming more and more, as we're growing in Christ, we're becoming more and more troubled of our sin inwardly for the point of Him drawing us to Himself. In fact, there ought to be, you know this, greater hatred of sin that leads to continually our fleeing to God, fleeing to Christ for grace and mercy and sanctification. So the hope and the promise there is we have confidence before God. We can come boldly to His throne of grace. The word confidence there in the original denotes fearlessness and an unhesitating confidence or faith in communion with God. Amen. So praise Him for that. Right? Praise Him for that confession of sin and that repentance that, uh, that draws us deeper and further in Him. Having confidence before God is one of the most uh, gladdening and freeing experiences this side of heaven. So He doesn't want us to wallow in the midst of our sin, right? But to be drawn near to Him always. God wants true believers to experience that deep, let me say that once more, loud. God wants true believers to experience the deep assurance that Jesus is theirs and that they belong to him. Not because of anything you've done or anything that I've done, we know that. Not because of anything that we failed even to do or in the next moment we didn't do the right way, but just because of who he is. Amen. Right? I already read 1 John 5, 10 through or 12 through 14. I won't read it again, but I will read John 10. 29 through 30 in light of this, in light of what John is saying here in this epistle, in light of what he said here in his gospel, John 10, 29 through 30. Thank God for this. You know that commercial. They still say you're in good hands with yeah, they do. They still say you're in good hands with all state insurance. You know. How much better is this? My father who has given them to me, that's the celebration of blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Hallelujah. Um, I had that picture of kids sna snatching things all day long in my house. All day long. All day long. You know, there's toys all over the place and, and snatch one here and snatch one. And then they just get a great thrill out of just snatch. It's not theirs. It's sitting over there. No one's touching it. No one cares about it. No one wants it. No one's playing with it, but it's one of theirs, and they'll go get it and just snatch it. And then they'll, ah, 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 and they'll run to the other one and show them that they got that toy, that they snatched, that they snatched it. Sometimes they'll rip it out of each other's hands, right? No one can snatch us out of our Father's hands. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. So praise God for that. Praise God for the confidence that, that we have. Um, before God. And the confidence that we have before God leads to um, verse 22, which we'll talk a little bit more about under application in another few minutes, but the confidence that we have before him to prayer is in verse 22. The confidence that we have that we belong to him, right, enables us to go freely to that throne of grace. Verse 22 says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And we'll talk more about both of those in a moment. But there's a connection there between confidence before God and prayer. Psalm 66, verses 18 through 20. Emphasize this. Hold on for one second. Psalm 66. 
What's the importance here of our um, confession and repentance of sin in our prayer life? Psalm 66, 18. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard, and he's given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away from my prayer, nor his loving kindness from me. So the confidence that we have before God in prayer because of who he is. All that is always, always, always because of who he is. Who he is. Amen. Because we keep his commandments to the things that are pleasing in his sight. Calvin used this motto, quorum Deo, in the presence of God. And he viewed and thought about his life as everything and how true this is scripturally, how true this is as everything. He saw every single moment, every single thing he did, every single thing he said, as always that the eye of God was upon him in the presence of God. That's a sobering, sobering thought. And oh, that I, and oh, that we could live more in the forefront of that thought, that reality, that everything we do and everything we say is done in the sight of God. And, and, and not well, from a holy reverence for him and appreciate for, for him, not so much from a fearful cowering of him, but if we do have that healthy fear of God, it'll keep us from sin, do the things that are pleasing in his sight. First John 3.19 um, Okay, no, it's okay. That word assure that we're talking about here. Believers have the assurance, the persuasion uh, that they belong to him. Some word, some translations render the word um, assure as pacify. Or make our hearts tranquil. Or quiet. You know, like, and only the blood of Christ can do that. And only our relationship with Christ can do that. That word there in verse 19, we know by this that we are of the truth, and he will assure our heart before him. How much how many times we need that assurance, um, that reminder, that comfort that our heart belongs to him. Or pacify. I think about pacify. Um, you know like when you're like all upset, someone's like all upset. Like a baby's all upset, and they're yelling, and they're screaming, and they're crying, and they need, some of them need a pacifier. A little baby needs a little pacifier. My, ours grew up on them. I remember when we went to the doctor and the dentist, and we told them that the dent, when we went to the dentist's office that the dentist is going to say you can't have your binky anymore, because the binky was that pacified them, like it soothed them. And so mine ran around with this thing in their mouth all the time. It was like, in fact, we used to call one of our kids a two-binky man. He'd have one in his right hand, and he'd have one in, one in maybe sometimes a three-binky man. One in his mouth, one in his hand. And you watch when they do it, it pacifies them, it quiets them down, it, it soothes them in some way, right? And God's Word says that the fact that we know Him, the fact that we belong to Him, we have that assurance, it, it pacifies and and, and soothes our heart, knowing that we belong to him and we have that confidence before him. In the midst of the, the Mark, what is it, chapter 4, moments when the, the perfect storm comes and hits us, or, or the difficulties and the trials of life come and hit us, and we have the um, assurance. Think about what you have and we have as a believer in Christ, the assurance that we have that we belong to him. Right? No matter what happens, no matter what goes on around us. I think about that in light of Psalm 133 in that pacifying and assuring our hearts in light of Psalm 133. Behold, that's not, that's not the right verse. Hold on. Is it 131? I wrote down 133. It's 131. Oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. For surely I have composed in that composure and that quietness of the soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. 
and that weaned child is not on the mother's milk anymore. It just could just rest there at the mother's breast without, like when they're hungry and they want food, they're all over, right? But they're now weaned, and that's the picture there, I think, of a, of a believer where the Lord, through the power of His Holy Spirit, can come fire our soul. Because we got confidence in knowing that we belong to Him. And we got confidence in knowing there's someone, something out there, um, bigger and greater than us. So, we can have the assurance that we're saved from our sins because true believers know that they belong to God. Secondly, true believers believe in God's Son, leading to true believers entrust to be saved. We entrust our spiritual well-being to Christ to live the Christian life. We have to entrust our spiritual well-being to Christ. Reading that makes you think of Colossians 2.6, where I'll give it to you in the version that I remembered, memorized, I think, when I first became a believer in Christ. Colossians 2.6 goes like this, just as Christ, just as you trusted Christ to save you, trust him too for each day's problems, live in vital union with him. That's probably from the book. It's either from the book or the Good News Bible. One or the other. True believers have that confidence before God. We can entrust our spiritual well-being to Christ. The verse there is, this is his commandment, that we believe. Okay. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one. But that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. What a relationship there between this is his commandment, that we believe and trust ourselves into Christ. And you know, it was a few weeks ago, I remember standing here sharing about that biblical word, belief. I think it was at Asia's baptism, maybe I don't know, but that biblical word for belief, you know what that means? It doesn't, it's a constant, ongoing belief. It's a present tense, it's ongoing, not just in the past. It affects the way we live now, in the present. This commandment that we believe Trust our spiritual well-being to Christ every day, every moment. And that's actually the first time that word believe appears in 1 John. It's a major word throughout John's Gospel. We'll see it more if we continue through um, John's epistle here. In light of the false teaching that was infiltrating the church there, um, that biblical belief in Jesus, in trusting oneself to Jesus. And the relationship between that so it's sort of like your clothes. Sort of like your clothes. I just got Troop 104. Cup steps? Cup steps? You in this troop? No, but okay. Troop 104. You got your shirt. She's got, we all got our apparel on, the things that we wear. I forgot what I was going to say. Just put that on my head. Hold on. This is the commandment that we believe in the name of the Son. Believe and trust. No one knows what I was about to say. Oh, it's like it's like the clothing that we wear. Oh no, okay, I got it. And the relationship between believing in the name of the Son and loving one another. Because we are Christians and because that's who we are, we wear the clothes, so to speak, or the apparel that we wear. It's a natural thing. It ought to be for us to really and truly love one another. Let's just start right here and then out there really love one another. And the, and, the, and, the, and the relationship between true believers and believing in Jesus and entrusting ourselves to Him and then our loving one another. Right? Loving one another. That connection. Verse 24 says, The one who keeps His commandments and abides in Him and He in Him, we know by this that He abides in us. I love this thought. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given to us. So that word abide is big. You know that in John. It's in John chapter 15. Um, one of John's favorite words to use to describe salvation. Abiding in him. United in him. In a relationship with him that goes way beyond just coming to church on Sunday. And it, it affects us daily with our prayer life and our Bible study and our relationship with him and our serving him and our living for him. And so he mentions there, we know that 
By this. By what? We know by what? We know by this that he abides in us. By what? By the Spirit whom he has given us. Romans 8, 9 says that if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. We know that he abides in us, that he remains with us, that he is in us by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. Romans 8, I just mentioned to you in verse 9, Romans 8, verse 16, all of Romans 8, great chapter on the power of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes I pray this, Romans 8, 16, I have to pray it more. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Holy Spirit within us testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So a great prayer is, Lord, I pray that your spirit today would testify with my spirit that I belong to you by how I act, by how I respond, by how I live. Holy Spirit bears witness, bears testimony. And we have um, in Ephesians chapter 1 that great verse about our election and our salvation. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 but just 13 and 14. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed with him, sorry, sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who has given us a pledge of our inheritance, which of you to the redemption of our own, God's own possession. Just think about that. Sometimes you read these words. It's like, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. We are God's own possession. That we belong to Him to the praise of His glory. So the Holy Spirit is that down payment. Like a down payment on an house. You can that illustration. The Holy Spirit is a down payment on Jesus' presence is in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. You've been born again. You've been saved. You belong to Him. His Holy Spirit is a down payment on more, 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 more of Jesus to come in the present through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, through being filled with the Holy Spirit, and then for all eternity. So that's a good commercial for the Herald of His Coming. The article for July and August is Our Great Need of the Holy Spirit. Spirit would have a more prominent, preeminent place in our lives and in our church. So true believers have that assurance that they're saved from their sins, that we belong to God, that we be and true believers believe in God's Son. So let's apply this a little bit here more. We've already talked about the first one. Because we belong to Him, let us love others. And I'll just give you the one verse that's up there. You're very familiar with this verse. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It is in John 15, and it's in 1 John 3, 11, and it's in 1 John 4, 7, 11. Let's go to the next one. Because we belong to him, we touched on this, the power of your spirit, Lord, help me to, to do the things that are pleasing to you. Putting off sin, repenting, confessing, turning to you. But Hebrews 13, 15, and 16 says, like we're worshiping now, right? This is a worship service. But through him then, let us continually, this is worship, this is worship, offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. What a glorious way to live, living in the presence of God. Through the power of his spirit, Lord, help us, help me, help each of us to live and do things that are, live in such a way that we seek to do things um, that are pleasing to you. Hebrews 13, 20 through 21 echoes it. Not only the God of peace who brought us up from the dead and the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good work. Equip you in every good thing to do his will, 
working in us which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. In light of the fact that we belong to Him, in light of the fact that we believe in Him, next application. Because we belong to Him, let's confess our sins to Him and repent. And so the two verses. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness. Thank God for this, but He's patient toward us, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this repent and return. I love Acts 3.19. Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away and times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord to enjoy the fullness of the Lord. Because he belongs, he must be confident before God in prayer is the next one in the verse is Hebrews 4, 16. And there's that word confidence. Let us draw near, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Confidence before him in prayer. I add this one and then I'm going to close. Do you have the confidence before God in knowing that you are saved? I think most of us in the room would say they're saved. Maybe somebody watching on YouTube or Facebook Live. Do you have the confidence before God knowing that you are saved, knowing that you belong to Him? I'll give you a verse to encourage you toward that end. 1 John 1, verse 7. It says, But if you walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. So it's only through the blood of Jesus, it's only through Him cleansing us of our sin as we trust in Him, as we repent, as we turn to Him in repentance and faith to be saved. So, foundational question. How has God invited me to take greater ownership of the truth that I belong to Him? Praise God that we belong to Him. Praise God that we know we're the truth. Let's share that truth of what we know about God and our relationship with Him, with others. Praise God that we can be confident before Him in prayer. May that urge us to go to Him more and more and more in prayer, to go boldly to the throne of grace. Praise God that He enables us to please Him by the power of His Holy Spirit. So let's seek to please Him more. You know, the quote for the week from Spurgeon says it this way, Every believer, every individual believer, is precious in the sight of the Lord. A shepherd would not lose one sheep, nor a jeweler one diamond. I can relate to that. Nor a mother one child, nor a man one limb in his body, of his body. Nor will the Lord lose one of his redeemed people. However little we may be, if we are the Lord's, we may rejoice that we are preserved in Christ. Or as it says in Jude 24 and 25, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, forever and ever. Amen. So before we show that video back there, we're going to continue with our...